Let's try to tackle the second question that we discussed earlier, which is whether there's any change in the wavelength for the transmitted or the refracted ray. So this is referring to the ray that managed to pass through from medium 1 to medium 2. We want to see whether there's any change in wavelength as compared to the wavelength in medium 1. Okay, so to understand that, you might need to recall the definition of index of refraction and also Snell's law. So the idea is you have medium 1 again, above, medium 2, below. So your medium 1, you can define the index of refraction N1 is defined as a ratio of speed of light in vacuum to the speed of light in medium 1 in particular. Okay, in N2, it will be the ratio of speed of light in vacuum to the speed of light in medium 2 itself. Okay, so today you have incident ray incident on this boundary over here then it gets refracted into medium 2 over here. I want to see whether there's any change in wavelength to medium 2. Uh, to not medium, to the light traveling in medium 2. Okay, so we know that in medium 1, your light is traveling according to this equation for its wave propagation speed, which is V is equals F lambda, a very standard equation. But you can see that V is labeled as V1 because we know that the speed of light in different medium, they are not the same. We learn this now, it can be faster, it can be slower depending on the index of refraction, right? So V1 here represents the speed of light in medium 1, whereas V2 here represents the speed of light in medium 2. Then your wavelength in medium 1 and wavelength in medium 2 for lambda 1 and lambda 2. But something you might be wondering is what, why is it F not labeled as F1 and F2? Why do we not need to differentiate between the frequency in medium 1 and the frequency in medium 2? Well, if you think about it, frequency 1 and frequency 2, frequency 2 must be the same. Okay, let's say today I uh, I am sending one pulse of wave in, in towards the boundary. I'm sending only one single pulse of wave to the boundary. You should expect that there's also one pulse of wave that will get transmitted and it will go further down medium 2, right? If I'm sending two pulses of wave, means I have one sign, Two sign. If I'm sending two sinusoidal pulse towards the boundary, you should expect that two sinusoidal uh, wave gets transmitted or gets refracted into medium two, right? Okay. So how many times I oscillate in the me in medium one, you see that same amount of oscillation gets transmitted into medium two. That's why if I oscillate five times within one second, then you see five times of uh, wave being transmitted into medium 2. <coughs> so uh, by using that logic, we know that the frequency should be the same because if I see five times of oscillation over here, the same thing will happen over here. You see that you get transmitted five times within uh, five times within a second. Okay. So right now, let's continue on our derivation. So we are going to find the relationship of wavelength in medium 2 with respect to medium 1. So let's put lambda 2 divided by lambda 1 just to find the ratio between the two wavelengths. We are going to substitute lambda 2. We are going to substitute it with V2 over F, which is bringing this F to the left-hand side. For lambda 1, we are going to bring F to the left-hand side. So this will be V2 over F and V1 over F. Again, the frequency, they are the same, so we can cancel it out. Then now, right now, you can see is lambda 2 over lambda 1 is equal to lambda v2 over v1. A very nice ratio over here. So basically the idea is if you are traveling at a faster speed, you have a greater lambda, okay, a larger lambda, larger wavelength. So if you are traveling slower, you have a shorter wavelength. Okay, that's the ratio that we can get for now. But let's change it into something that we can know for sure, which is the index of refraction. Usually, if we know a material properly, we should know its index of refraction. So it's better to express it in terms of index of refraction rather than the speed of light itself. Okay, so V2 over here, we are going to change it to become C over N2. So basically, just shifting the C to the left hand side. So C over N2 over here. So for lambda 1, we are going to. Uh, for V1, we are going to replace it with C over N1, just bring a C to the left-hand side. So now you get C over N2 divided by C over N1. Now we can cancel the C, shift and rearrange everything. Now you get equation lambda 2 over lambda 1 is equals N1 over N2. Now this is an equation that we use more often because N1 and N2 are usually known. Like let's say air is 1.00, water is 1.33. There are some standard value that we can easily know. So it's a it's an equation that we can easily use. Okay, so let's say if lambda 1 is air, let's say, so we can put lambda 1, we can know its wavelength. Usually the wavelength in air is usually known. So we can substitute lambda 1 easily. 
we know r is 1.00 for its index of refraction we can substitute n1 so let's say if the second medium is n2 is a uh, water so we can put in 1.33 then from there you can find the wavelength in water so it's a very simple equation to use if you're interested with the uh with the wavelength in medium 2 so it's just n1 divided by n2 multiplied by alpha 1 so in the usual situation we usually have the wavelength in air or the vacuum wavelength that's is usually lambda one nah. those are usually known are usually given okay and at the same time you usually know the two medium that you're traveling what are the index of refraction you know n1 and n2 so from there you can easily determine the wavelength in the specific medium let's say glass or water okay so this is a very handy equation which we'll be using to derive the equation to study the interference of reflected light in deep films